This is the third part of my talk about an introduction to radioactivity. In the first part I talked about radioactive decay processes and in the second part I talked about how the different uh, radiations uh, interact with matter. So now in this third part I'm going to talk about how we use that information to decide on the appropriate red nuclides that are used in nuclear medicine. So we need to distinguish between two applications. In radioisotope therapy we're administering a large amount of radioactive material as a treatment. What we want to do is to have radiation that's absorbed in a particular area of the patient to give a radiation dose to that part of the patient whilst sparing the rest of the, the body. In radioisotope imaging we want to administer a much smaller amount of radioactive material for the purposes of diagnosis. What we want to do there is to detect the radiation that's coming from the patient in order to see where it is uh, accumulated. Uh, and the aim there is to keep the radiation dose as low as possible. So we have two different uh, applications uh, with different aims. I'm going to talk about the desirable radionuclide properties for diagnostic nuclear medicine imaging, since that's the vast majority of nuclear medicine studies. The type of emission is important. Uh, we obviously don't want alpha or beta particle emissions because they're too easily stopped in the body. Their range is very short so they won't get out of the patient. We can't detect them outside the body. So the radiation will be absorbed in the patient, give them an unnecessary radiation dose without contributing anything to an image. So gamma ray emission is essential for imaging purposes. That will allow us to detect the radiation from outside the patient's body. The energy of the gamma rays is important as well. If the energy is too low, there will be too many absorbed in the patient. So an energy of more than about 100 kV will allow sufficient to escape from the patient. However, it wants to be less than about 300 kV, otherwise the gamma rays will be so energetic they will go straight through our gamma camera detector. In fact, an ideal energy will be less than 200 kV, uh, otherwise it's too difficult to make effective collimators. So 100 to 200 kV is the ideal range, with 300 kV being a really an upper limit. The radioactive half-life is also important. It needs to be long enough to take the measurements. Usually that means a few hours. Uh, it needs enough time to uh, prepare the red nuclide uh, into a pharmaceutical to administer it to the patient and to get the images that we need. Uh, so a few hours is usually sufficient for that. Although for some tests uh, we need to take me measurements over several days and therefore sometimes we do want a longer half-life. But the half-life shouldn't be unnecessarily long to minimise the radiation exposure because if the uh, activity lasts long after we finish the pictures then we're uh, giving unnecessary radiation uh, dose. So we need to keep the half-life as short as possible. We also need to think about the method of production. Um, nuclear reactors are used for producing radionuclides which have an excess of neutrons. In a reactor there are lots of neutrons flying around so if you introduce some stable uh, nuclides the excess neutrons will turn them into radioactive forms with too many neutrons. However, the suitable nuclear reactors are, uh, are only a few facilities worldwide, so you need something with a long enough half-life to allow time for it to be distributed from the reactor centre to the hospital where it's going to be used. However, these do tend to be relatively cheap methods of production. Uh, cyclotrons are used for aid nuclides with an excess of protons because a cyclotron can accelerate protons and let it hit targets of other stable nuclides to turn them into a radioactive nuclide with an excess of protons. Um, these facilities are rather expensive um, and so if you're going to use a, a distant one it has limited uh, availability unless you've got enough money to have a dedicated cyclotron on your own site. Radionuclide generators are useful where we can have a, one other nuclide that decays into another. The parent decays into the one that we want in a generator and these can be produced on site, are readily available and are re relatively cheap.
we also need to think about the chemistry of our red nuclide. Uh, what we aim to do is to use um, our red nuclide to produce what we call radiopharmaceuticals. That's a chemical which goes into the part of the body that we're interested, uh, labelled with a radioactive label, which is our red nuclide. Um, so we need a red nuclide that will easily bind to a variety of different molecules. So preferably we want something that's common uh, in biology, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, things like that. So let's go through some uh, examples of things that we've considered. Iodine-131 has convenient chemistry because iodine is a, a nice element that occurs in all sorts of molecules. So you can take a molecule with some stable iodine, substitute radioactive iodine, it behaves exactly the same chemically, and yet you've got the label to see where it goes. Um, Iodine-131 is produced in a nuclear reactor naturally from fission fragments. So it's re pretty cheap. It's, it's actually almost considered to be nuclear waste. It has a half-life of eight days. Um, that's convenient for delivery because you've got to get it from the reactor and eight days allows plenty of time for delivery. But that's rather too long for most imaging studies. So it'll hang around in the patient much longer than is really necessary. So that's really not a good point. It does decay by beta decay and gives gamma emissions. Um, the problem there is the, the beta particles will give a high local dose, which is not what we want for imaging. But if we're interested in, in therapy, for example, uh, treating uh, thyroid, either for thyroid cancers or for overactive thyroid, then this sort of thing is very good. But it does limit the activity that you can use for imaging, otherwise you get too high a radiation dose. The gamma ray energy of 364 kV means that the gamma rays will get out of the patient, but they're rather too difficult to collimate. It's above our um, nice uh, limit of 300 kV, so we get rather poor quality images with the gamma camera detectors. So ID-131 is uh, good for therapy, but not very good for imaging. Iodine-123 has the same convenient chemistry as iodine-131, uh, but it's cyclotron produced, uh, which limits its availability and makes it rather expensive. However, the half-life of 13 hours is excellent and it's good for most imaging studies. Uh, best of all, uh, it decays by electron capture decay, which means it gives pure gamma emissions with no beta particles and that results in a low radiation dose because most of the gamma rays will escape from the patient. In fact the gamma ray energy at 159 keV is nicely within our ideal range of 100 to 200 keV so it gives very good quality gamma camera images. Technetium-99M is the radionuclide that I used as an example of a metastable state in the first part of this talk. Uh, its generator produced from the decay of molybdenum-99, and molybdenum-99 is a fission product that comes from nuclear reactors. It's got a half-life of three days, so there's plenty of time to distribute it from the reactors to hospitals where it's needed. So generators are readily available and cheap, and they can produce technetium 99M on a daily basis for use in hospitals. It has a half-life of six hours, which is excellent for most imaging studies, and it decays by isomeric transition, which is very good because it gives pure gamma emissions with no beta particles at all, and has a low radiation dose for the patient because most of the gamma rays will escape from the patient. In fact, the gamma ray energy at 140 kV is perfect in the middle of our window of ideal energies between 100 and 200 kV. So technetium 99M gives excellent uh, quality gamma camera images. The only slight difficulty with technetium 99M is uh, that it has difficult chemistry because there are no stable isotopes. Technetium is one of the very few uh, elements that has no stable isotopes at all, so it doesn't occur naturally in nature. Therefore, you can't take an existing molecule uh, and replace the stable technetium with radioactive technetium 99M, like you could do with something like iodine. Because there is no stable technetium, it doesn't exist in any existing molecules. So the chemists have to develop clever methods of labelling suitable radiopharmaceuticals by tagging on technetium atoms where they don't really belong. Uh, 
but they've been clever enough to do that. Unfortunately, nowadays we have a variety of kits available where you can just add some technetium solution to a vial and magically it becomes labelled and therefore produce a pharmaceutical labelled with technetium 99M. And as a result, technetium 99M is the red nuclide that's used in the vast majority of nuclear medicine imaging studies nowadays. Carbon 11 is a red nuclide that I didn't mention previously, but it has excellent chemistry because carbon is a constituent of many biologically interesting molecules, so it's very easy to label things with carbon. Um, it decays by positron emission and as I said in the previous part the positrons uh, then stop and annihilate with electrons giving two 511 kV gamma rays and that is good for positron emission tomography using PET scanners. Uh, it has a half-life of 20 minutes uh, which is not bad as long as you can get it into the patient quickly. Um, uh, it's cyclotron produced so with a half-life of 20 minutes you have to have an on-site cyclotron you haven't time to get it distributed from anywhere else so that means it's going to be expensive to have your own on-site cyclotron so it's a bit too expensive for routine work it tends to be used for research. Fluorine 18 is another red nuclide that decays by positron emission so it also is good for PET positron emission tomography. It's got a half-life of two hours uh, which is uh, very good uh, because it means we can get away with an off-site cyclotron so as long as you've got a cyclotron within a couple of hours traveling time you can have fluorine 18 delivered to your hospital without having to have your own cyclotron. Uh, it has fairly good chemistry um, it's not quite like carbon, nitrogen and oxygen. Um, fluorine is not a common biological element, but fortunately it behaves similarly to a hydroxyl group, so it can be used to label various compounds and the variety of fluorine labelled compounds available. So if we look at the red nuclides for nuclear medicine, we see that iodine-131 is widely used for therapy. The beta emissions there will give a local radiation dose, which is what we want for therapy. It does also have some gamma emissions, but they're rather high energy, uh, so it's poor for imaging. Iodine-123, on the other hand, is good for imaging because it has good gamma emissions, but it's expensive because it's cyclotron produced and limited availability. Technetium 99M, on the other hand, is used for most gamma camera studies in nuclear medicine. It is excellent for imaging and is readily available from a generator and cheap. Carbon 11 is used for PET research studies, uh, but you do need an on site cyclotron to uh, use it. Fluorine 18 is used for most routine PET studies. Uh, it is av available, therefore, from an off site cyclotron because its half life is longer. So to summarise this introduction to uh, radioactivity, I've explained that when atoms undergo radioactive decay they emit radiation, either alpha, beta or gamma. Alpha emitters are not used in diagnostic imaging, uh, they have a very uh, local radiation dose. They are sometimes now used um, in special sorts of therapy though. Beta emitters are also good for therapy. They can be used for diagnosis as long as only small quantities are administered. Positron emitters can be used for diagnostic imaging uh, if we have PET scanners, positron emission tomography. Gamma emitters can be also used for diagnostic imaging with conventional gamma cameras. And we've seen that gamma rays in fact behave just like X-rays, so they need to be used with caution but they are capable of imaging pharmaceuticals inside patients, which is what nuclear medicine is all about. So that's the end of this, uh, this talk. I hope that it's helped to explain uh, what radioactivity is and how it can be used, particularly in nuclear medicine.